Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for sparing your valuable time to uh, to join this session. I hope it's useful. Just uh, carrying on what was said about the Q&A <clears throat> revision books, the Q&A books and the concentrate books, uh, they are helpful guides. Um, one thing we'd have to be careful about is that uh, you don't copy and paste examination answers in those books into your examination really use them as an opportunity to see what we're looking for as, as lecturers, the sorts of style that you should be adopting, how you introduce the subject, how do you plan an answer, and the amount of cases and materials that you have to use in your answer, etc. I think the, those books really come to their best use when, when you adopt them in that way, instead of saying, well, this is, uh, this is going to be my answer. It was good enough for uh, £11.50, which I paid for the, for the book, and therefore I'm going to replicate it, that you then get into trouble. So uh, I'm Dr. Steve Foster. I'm an associate professor, uh, professor in law at Coventry University, and I've been teaching and writing for 45 years now. So um, I've got a lot of experience, but I don't think I've experienced anything quite like the last 18 months, and that's really created a great deal of challenges for, um, for students and staff uh, in terms of teaching the course, uh, having a student experience, but particularly setting and uh, answering assessments, etc. As you can see there, I'm the author of Human Rights and Civil Liberties Question and Answer, and also write, uh, uh, author of a, a book called Legal Writing Skills, which tells you how to write law essays and answer problem questions, etc. Uh, just to see what we're going to do today, I've called it exam technique in the pandemic that although I'm going to be giving some tips on how to approach and carry out and construct exam questions, uh, I'm going to concentrate on doing that under the very challenging circumstances of the pandemic and online exams, because I'm assuming that all of you are going to be doing your exams online with extra time to do it, but with different challenges, etc. So we're going to talk about different exam formats and expectations of staff, uh, how to revise and prepare for those law exams, how to prepare and act on the day, uh, depending on how long that day is, how long that window is, constructing answers to law essays and problem questions, that will be sort of general advice, and Equally importantly, what to write and what not to write. And that's going to be particularly important when you've got all the materials in front of you is to be discriminatory in terms of what you're writing and what you're not including. Um, we're going to give some brief advice about using primary and secondary sources in, in particularly online exams and the expectations that the staff will have in terms of citing and referencing sources. Um, we're going to give you that final um, guidance about proofreading and checking your answers. And you've got a lot more opportunity to do that uh, in terms of uh, online exams. And I'm going to finish off by giving some guidance about writing answers in contract and tort law. I've chosen those not just because I've taught those particular areas, but I would describe them as heavy case law and statute based subjects. So I'm going to give some advice about how we write answers in contract and tort law. And then to compare and contrast with that, uh, my area, which is public law and human rights, how the answers, how writing answers in public law and human rights exams differs uh, in that res in, in any respect. Uh, I don't know whether. Uh, there are any questions so far? I've said that we will pause at the end of each um, each slide, but uh, if there hasn't haven't been any questions so far, I'll push on. No questions so far. Okay, yeah, I didn't expect <laughs> any at this stage. So let's start with the different exam formats um, that you're going to experience and the expectations, obviously, of staff of you in these new circumstances. We, I assume everybody is going to be doing their examinations online and that they're going to be open book. So a lot, all this advice is going to be predicated on, on that particular basis. It means, therefore, that we're going to have longer exam times, that two-hour, three-hour period in the 
physical exam room now is gone. And I wouldn't be surprised if we've seen the last of it anyway. Um, and of course, you're going to possibly uh, be answering exam questions on the basis of seen questions. So we'll take that into account as well. Now, there are certain benefits of that. Obviously, it takes the heat off you, the exam panic, etc. There's an opportunity to prepare answers, materials, and to consult sources in advance and, in fact, on the day of the exam. And a greater opportunity to revise your answers and proofread. It becomes more akin to a coursework in many respects. The disadvantages, of course, have been, firstly, more generally, you've had a lack of face-to-face -face interaction and tuition. That's a, it, not only in terms of the semester itself, but the opportunity to have face-to-face -face teaching with um, uh, or face-to-face -face guidance with other students, uh, your contemporaries and your tutors and your lecturers, etc. It has resulted, therefore, in you as students having to take more initiative to learn. Now, I know from personal experience, the um, the efforts that staff have made to make sure that materials are online and we've gone beyond um, our normal duties in that respect but sometimes there is no alternative or real alternative for that face-to-face -face interaction and we have put a, a little bit more initiative on students to go away and research and find out the basic materials etc normally you'd get those from lectures um, the online exam, particularly where uh, it's open book, creates a dilemma for students of what to include and what to leave out. There's a great temptation to cut and paste because those sources are readily uh, available to you, etc. And we'll be talking about that temptation and how to, to cope with it. And of course, there will be, in, a, in many respects, an increased expectation on behalf of examiners from you in terms of the content, in terms of the style and structure, because you will have more time to prepare the answers and you will have the materials in front of you. We are um, fairly flexible uh, normally, of course, in normal exam conditions that you might forget names of cases or particular words, etc. and um, to a certain extent, uh, indulge in a little bit of garbled um, structure during the examination when that panic is on, etc. Those expectations are, are changed a little bit in terms of online exams where you've got a little more time to prepare and construct things. So I'm going to start off by just giving some general tips. Um, about how to prepare for examinations, how to revise and prepare for, in particular, online examinations. First point is make sure that you know the format and content of that exam. Is it going to be open book? Are they going to be problem questions? Are they going to be essay questions? What topics are going to come up, etc.? More and more information now is available to students than it was in the past on this. Make sure you get that information from the horse's mouth. Don't get this information from fellow students. Get it from your tutors. Please don't think that you can revise on the day that you can open up the exam. I'm assuming that people are getting quite extensive periods to do the examination. At Coventry, we give them 16, 16 hours. We open at six o'clock, close at 10 o'clock at night. Um, but please don't think that you can revise on the day, even within that time limit. This will lead to desperate cut and, pass, cut and paste strategies and is not good practice. The ideal, of course, um, and we'll save this from the outset, is that if you've engaged with the subject and the topics from day one and throughout the course, then that is brilliant. You can then come to the exam doing revision. And I say to the students, most of you don't do revision. You're doing vision during this particular time. You're looking at it for the first time. If you're looking at it for the first time, um, even a couple of weeks before the examination, you've got to appreciate that you're looking at it for the first time. Please don't call it revision. Um, so you've got to um, approach it accordingly. If you haven't been able, um, if you've been unable to actually revise, then start 
uh, or unable to, rather to engage with the module throughout the year, start your preparation, your revision preparation and vision pop, um, preparation as soon as you possibly can. The main thing to do with these online exams is prepare your materials in advance. Not only do your revision, but prepare your materials in advance so that they're, they're accessible by your side on the day of the exam. And that includes extracts from books and your and your tech, including your textbook, journals, cases, statutes, treaties, etc., websites, news items, whatever sources you think that you're going to use, because normally students will be given at least um, an indication of what topic is going to come up. Sometimes uh, they, get, they get a little bit more than that. So you've got to predict what sort of materials you're going to need. Make sure you've got them there in advance. Don't um, presume that the question is going to be exactly as you wish, but at least you're in the general area. You know what cases that you might use, you know what journal pieces, and try and be as specific as possible in that respect. You're then in a position to construct your answers, I say at leisure, that's easy for me, I'm not doing the examination, you will have a certain amount of exam nerves. But if you are already preparing your materials and setting them aside, the points that you're going to raise, there will be a certain amount of leisure du during that particular um, period. For seeing questions, obviously prepare your, advan uh, your answers uh, in advance, but I'm not sure whether there are going to be many exams with seeing questions. Make sure that you highlight when you're doing your revision, highlight and ensure you understand the key issues and the arguments that might come up in that particular question. So a lot of students sometimes forget the basics. They forget the the general principles of contract, tort, et cetera, et cetera, and the general themes that run through a subject like separation of powers, parliamentary sovereignty, public policy, human rights, et cetera. Highlight those in your revision and make sure you actually understand them. Very often students use those words and phrases. They're just words to them, but they don't fully understand what they mean. Ensure that you've got an appreciation of those key issues and arguments. And perhaps practice constructing your answers within a time frame. Now, in these online examinations, you might have a very expansive period of time, but they will recommend that you do each question within about an hour and about 1500 words or a thousand words per, per answer. So practice in advance, doing that under exam conditions to see what you can do in that particular period of time. Now, obviously you might have longer, you've obviously got longer time to proofread, et cetera, but principally you'll be looking to do two exam questions, for example, in a couple of hours, an hour each, and doing about 1, 1,500 words each. If you don't practice that, you tend to cut and paste and produce very long and elaborate answers which don't really get to the question. Sorry, Alison, I haven't been uh, pausing after each one, but I'm not sure whether any questions have come in. That's OK. We have um, someone that's going to be ducking out before the end of the... All right, OK. Um, so um, she's asking um, a question that I thought could, we could sneak in here, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she has... She's asking if you have any tips on how to answer defamation problem questions in tort. <laughs> the word right. is very tight, so they've been warned to be prepared for it. Right. And is this an essay question? Um, is it an essay question? A problem question? A problem question, yeah. Well, I think with problem questions, and we're going to get onto this later on, luckily I do know a little bit about defamation. Uh, and the thing about defamation is that you, the answer uh, will vary depending on whether you're doing it in a tort exam or whether you're doing it in a human rights exam. In a tort exam, you tend to concentrate on the basic principles. What is a defamatory statement? How serious it has to be? And all the defences, etc. And you do it in a rather legalistic way. Um, and in a human rights um, answer on defamation, we're always concentrating on fundamental principles 
like press freedom, freedom of speech, the public right to know and government accountability. So you, you, you adopt a slightly different approach on defamation depending on what module you're doing it on. But in terms of problem questions, I think the advice that you're getting from the tutors is very wise in the sense that when you're doing a problem question, there is a tendency of students to say, I'm going to deal with one point, for example, the defense of honest opinion or fair comment, etc. And I'm going to write absolutely everything I know because I've learned it and you're going to get it back. Now, you've got to, you've got to imagine that you're advising a client. They only need to know the law that's going to help them resolve that particular problem. So, I think the, the, the real feature of a good answer in problem questions, particularly when you're given a word limit, et cetera, is can you identify not only the, the general legal areas, but the specific points which are raised by the scenario? Because those dictate what you're going to talk about. Can you identify them quickly? Can you explain the law quickly? And then can you uh, apply that law to that factual scenario quickly and come up with a sensible conclusion? So I think uh, it's a long winded answer, I'm sorry, but I think that the key really is don't spend too much time talking about general areas of law. You're not repeating a textbook. You're advising a client, identify the point identify the legal principle in the case law, et cetera, and apply it as quickly as you can. So uh, hopefully that would be uh, a useful answer. Uh, we also have um, someone that's going to be having a written assignment examination on human rights with a case scenario. And um, they were just wondering what you would advise are significant points to take in account for that kind of examination. Right. So this looks to be like a coursework in, in restricted times, in a restricted time. I think that that might be the case, is it? Um, I am not sure, but I'm sure they will write something. So how them. did you, how did you is, describe it, then, Alison? There is, there is no time limit, they've just um, told me, but um, they're having a written ass assignment examination on high, human rights with a case scenario. Right. So there's a deadline time, but no sort of, um, specific time limits. Right. OK. Um, well, it obviously does depend on um, on what's in the case scenario, etc. Uh, and I suppose I'd have to give a warning here that I can't answer the questions for, for the students <laughs> in advance, etc. Um, but again, I think I would repeat what I've said before. If, if this answer doesn't fully meet your, your, your question, then post something else in the chat box. But again, if I was setting that type of case scenario, I want students to be able to instantly recognize what human rights are at issue and what dilemmas are at issue, whether it's a balance between press freedom and privacy, or whether it's a balance between liberty and privacy and state security and public safety, et cetera. And again, if it's a, a case scenario, I don't think the members of staff particularly want you to write full-blooded essays on each and every aspect of the, of the question. I think they want you to identify what the issues are, uh, have a knowledge of those general issues, and give some advice, I don't know whether you're advising the government or making general observations, etc. Uh, but I think the real key skill in that case uh, is, uh, is identifying in that scenario, what human rights issues are at, at issue, what convention rights, etc, at issue, what human rights act provisions are at issue, and uh, identifying them and being able to realize what the dilemma is. Ah, well, people are claiming their right to privacy, but how do we balance that against state surveillance or public safety or national security, etc.? Uh, but again, it's very difficult for me to go beyond that or be more specific without knowing the question. And no, I don't want to know the specific question. I'm not going to give an answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think it was around trans transgendered persons persons rights but um it sounds like you've covered 
sort of the basic points of how to do it. Yeah, again, if it's on if it's on a specific issue, I think what the what the member of staff wants is yes, you've got a very good core knowledge of that area of transgender issues, etc. But don't write it as an essay, write it in terms of giving advice or making observations about that particular scenario. Look at the words of the scenario very carefully, identify what dilemmas and issues it raises, et cetera, and concentrate on those. Thank you. Um, that's it for questions at the moment. So right. um, okay. I will shout out if we have any more. <laughs> yeah, I'm just talking, uh, you know, about pr principally revising and preparing, etc. Um, and again, it is a lot easier if you work during the semester, if you have built up that knowledge during the semester. And but I am accommodating the fact that some students here and other students, et cetera, might not have had that particular privilege, might not have done that. Um, but again, prepare yourself for the particular day in the sense of getting your material sorted uh, in advance, that you're not looking out and scouting about for them on the day because that causes panic and eventually it causes um, uh, cutting and pasting. Uh, on the day of the exam, open it as soon as soon as it opens. As soon as the exam opens and ours open at six o'clock, open it up. Have a look at the questions. Make sure that uh, you're comfortable with them, etc. I'm stating the obvious. Don't book anything else on that day. But we do get students who have phoned me within an hour to go and say, oh, I've just been at work. Can you extend the time a little bit? Uh, no, we can't, I'm afraid. So I'm just making that pretty obvious point. When you open up, take time to read the paper. You, you might have a very good idea what you're, what's going to come up. You might have... Uh, been given, or they will say, here is a very similar question. It's usually almost an identical question with a couple of names changed, etc. But take time to read the paper, see that it connects with your expectations. Yes, I was expecting a, a problem question on occupiers' liability or uh, product liability, etc. And make sure it's there in your expectations with respect to content, uh, substantive content, and the format as well. Check that the sources that you've prepared in advance are sufficient and appropriate. So you look at that and say, yeah, I've done a lot of revision there. Oh, I didn't expect that little bit to come up about um, whether uh, Britain's constitution is comparable with the United States. Well, I better go and go and do some preparation on that. I knew something was going to come up on the UK constitution. I wasn't quite expecting that. You'll have time then to go and um, to research some extra sources. If you have done little or no preparation for the exam, I'd say two things. One, don't panic too much because you will have your resources there. You'll have your sources there. You'll have your materials there and you'll have a lot of time. But the other thing is be realistic. If you haven't done any preparation and you haven't engaged with the module all through the year, it's unlikely, even in a space of 10 or 15 hours, you're going to be able to research, um, understand, revise, and construct a perfectly good academic essay or a very, very good academic essay in that particular time. It's best on, in those circumstances to use the basic materials, your notes, text, casebook, to provide a satisfactory answer than to attempt to research and write a scholarly and excellent piece. That might not sound uh, very sensible. Well, why can't I write a scholarly piece in 16 hours? Because in my experience, those people who try and do that end up cutting and pasting information without any real appreciation or understanding of the subject, and it becomes a real mess. Um, but if they play it safe and keep it clear and simple, etc., there is the possibility of making up ground in these exams, where, of course, in the past, you're in that exam room for two hours. If you don't know now, uh, then you're not going to write anything. So it, it is very different in, in, in those circumstances. Constructing your answers uh, on the day, um, if you, it's an unseen question, again, look at the question carefully. The staff now will be expecting you 
to answer the question. Because if you don't and you write general stuff, the staff are going to respond by saying, well, the general stuff in, is in the books. Anybody can copy out of the books, etc." We expect you to read the question carefully and answer the question carefully. And I always say, when you look at an essay question or you look at a problem question, you should be asking two questions. What's this generally about? What's this question legally generally about? All right, it's a, it's a question about the UK constitution and its sources and features, etc. But what is it specifically about? What specific angle and nuance has the question raised? And the question may, may well be, has Britain, considering its features and, and sources, has Britain truly got a constitution? Now, that question is specifically about whether British constitution is truly a constitution and what is a true constitution. The bits about the nature and sources are a bit of background, etc., which you can get from, from general textbooks. So staff will be expecting more and more of you in terms of actually answering the question which they've constructed. For essay questions, build your plan and consult your prepare sources. Or if you haven't prepared any, then make a list of required sources and start looking for them. Build your answers carefully, perhaps starting with the introduction. And the introduction is really important. The introduction gives you an opportunity to get rid of certain definitions and basic framework that gives you an opportunity to say to the examiner, I know what this question is about. I know what the dilemma is. So if you start with your introduction by saying, well, this not just saying this question is and repeat the question, but this question raises these particular issues, legal, political, social issues, etc. And this, in this essay, I am going to examine A, B, C and D. You've now got a very good structure. So, again, the purpose of an introduction is not only to say how you're going to answer the question. Don't just start by saying in this essay, I'm going to do this, this, this and this. Start off with a couple of sentences which indicate that you actually understand what the question is about, that you know it's about human rights, you know it's about the conflict between human rights and national security, etc. So do that, building your answers carefully. Once you've got your introduction sorted, then delve into your sources, consult your plan, have a look at the sources, have a look at the um, how you're going to shape and construct that particular paragraph and then move on from there. Uh, leave time perhaps to revise and proofread, not only at the end of each paragraph, but obviously at the end. Now, obviously, this is going to take longer if you haven't prepared your materials in advance. Leave time to learn, therefore, uh, digest and consider. Moving on to um, problem questions, again, identify the general legal areas. We're going to have a look at a couple of examples in a moment, but you'd look at a, a contract problem and say, right, it's about formation and terms, or it's about consideration and intention, etc. That's what I've got to concentrate on. I don't need to talk about misrep or mistake or remedies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then what specific factual legal issues are raised? You can go through the scenario, you can say, right, I'm going to have to discuss what was the initial approach by Tom? Was that an offer or an invitation to treat? When Sheila said that she'd accepted the offer, was that a true acceptance? So what you're doing is that you're looking at a problem question and you have firstly identified what the question is about legally, but now you're deciding what are the real factual stroke legal issues. At each point, a legal or factual issue is arising and you've got to consider that. Make sure you identify them all and you can deal with them logically. And then you can start placing your sources beside each point. So you can say, right, I'm going to deal with these five or six problem issues, etc., rising from the scenario. And I'm going to introduce that case for that point, that case for that, that statute for that point, these two cases for that point, etc. So I think you know, you can do this in, in seminars throughout the year. You do this for your revision and you do that on the day. You say, there's my plan. Those are the points I'm going to make. And this is where I'm going to fit in each of my each parts of my um, sources, etc.
Anything else so far, Alison? Yes, um, we've got a student who is say, asking about clarification on paired sources. Um, it sounds like the university has been has told them to treat the exams as if it were a normal exam, so go into it with no extensive research, um, like as in as if it were coursework, but more like um, and as if they were going to a normal exam. So I'd have thought in that instance they're, they're saying does it mean cases and statutes so if, it, if they were going to an exam in a normal situation it would be the statutes that they would take in wouldn't it yeah um so in a normal exam yes you can take statutes in uh sometimes you're allowed to annotate etc but i'm sort of drawing a distinction between the old mem memory test that you used to have and now the test of saying well here's a question uh, you've got more, you've got time and you've got your sources to do it. Now, uh, I'm not sure what point is being made here. I've, I've suggested that um, obviously there may be circumstances where the examiner says, even though you've got 16 hours, even though you've got all your materials, be prepared to write examination questions in an hour. So that's what I meant by exam conditions. Uh, and I think that hour time frame disciplined you to say there's only a certain amount that I can and should be writing in this particular answer. And by limiting myself to an hour, I can keep within those particular constraints. I'm not suggesting that in an open book exam, you read them in advance and then push them away and try and remember it all by, um, by memory. And that, that's certainly not what I'm expecting. Um, so I think what, what we're trying to suggest is that in these unusual times, if you've revised, you've got all the materials in front of you and you can refer to them, that, that is fine. That takes all the way the heart, takes all the heartache away, et cetera. But try and remember that in, in at least the time frame, try and do it within an hour and an hour and a half. Now that doesn't mean you have to do it in an hour and a half and then submit it, etc. You could be fiddling about with it, go and have a cup of tea, come back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we want about an hour or an hour and a quarter's worth, or about a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred worth. If we don't do that, students hand in answers of about 10,000 words, uh, each answer, and there's no correlation between the length and the quality of the answer. It, it, won't, it won't address the question. There'll just be a lot of unnecessary flab there. So I think that's answered that, that particular query or clarified that particular qu query. But if it hasn't, again, put, post another one in the chat. Yeah, um, we also have a question from Holly saying, please, could you cover how to avoid making a problem question sound repetitive? For example, if two people have a similar issue. Yeah. Um, what I always suggest is that if you're advising, um, let's say, Sheila, Tom and Ben, um, and I always say, I always advise them to go through the, the people individually start with Sheila etc etc now once you deal with Sheila you might say um, the problem here is um, whether the advert was an offer or an invitation to treat and you talk about offers and invitations to treat and how the court make that particular distinction um, when you come to the other people they might have the same problem now instead of going through the whole thing again you can say, as we saw when we were advising Sheila, the, nat the natural consequence here that this was, in fact, an, a contractual offer and not an invitation to treat, and therefore we're proceeding on that basis. Now, the real issue in Tom's case is such and such. So you can refer back to what you've already said, as we've already established the definition of consideration or the requirements of intention, and it applies in this case, then rather than repeating it, you just refer back to what you've already said in relation to one party. I think that's um, one of the sort of tips I tend to use, because otherwise uh, you're padding out the answer with the same information again. Yeah. 
So it's really just referring back to what you've already done. That was a good question. Um, that's it for now. Um, just um, someone else saying that um, there are level six students at the University of Hertfordshire and they really enjoyed your legal writing skills book. Oh, right. Thank you. The lecturer okay. is recommending it. So that's just right, a, that's good. Thank you. I, always, I always recommend that you buy two copies, one for the work <laughs> at university and one at home. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so that, you. For that's that. it for now. <laughs> right. OK, let's move on then. OK, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about and I think we've already touched on this, what to write and what not to write. Um, there is a tendency, a temptation to cut and paste and write everything that you possibly know, etc. But unlike A level and college, you're not going to get rewarded for correct but irrelevant information. We like to we like to test the students to say, right, what is relevant? And if you just have the dartboard effect in the sense that you can't th really throw darts, but you know that eventually you're going to hit the bull if you throw 100 darts at the board, we don't like that particular style. So you're not going to get rewarded for correct but irrelevant information. This is especially important in online and open book exams because the temptation is so strong to cut and paste, uh, particularly for unprepared students. So make sure that you read the question carefully, plan your answer, moving from the general to the specific, and keep checking at the end of each paragraph, am I actually addressing the question? Am I making a statement at the end of each paragraph which tells the marker, yes, I understand the point and I'm putting it in the context of the question. Ensure that if you have to cover some basics, so we'll talk, you know, let's say you get a taught essay about psychiatric injury. Um, you can talk a, a little bit about the basics of establishing a duty of care in negligence, but that is very ancillary to the to the real question you deal with that in a in a couple of sentences a lot of students tend to say i'm comfortable here talking about duty of care and breach of duty and before they know where they are they've written the, uh, almost two pages of almost irrelevant or really no more than background information so if you are going to cover the basics, the basic fundamentals, etc., do those as clearly and swiftly as possible. Don't labour the point simply because you've got three pages on it. Uh, so concentrate on the specific issues. So, for example, in a constitutional exam, I set a question, have we got a true constitution? I don't want pages and pages and pages on the features and the sources of the UK constitution. I want you to match those sources to whether we've got a true constitution. Tell me what a true constitution is and then uh, do, do our features match, etc. But a lot of students will stay in their safety zone. And the safety zone is here are the sources, statutes and conventions, etc., etc., not really answering the question. And again, with problem questions, concentrate on the relevant legal areas. A lot of students in problem questions say that uh, for a contract, you have to have this, this, and this. And they talk about offer and acceptance and intention and um, consideration and illegality, et cetera. And they say, they then say that this problem only raises the first one. And they've, they've already talked for three or four pages about all the issues. Um, now, sometimes they do that purposely so that they can fill the page, etc., and hope that the examiner won't notice. Uh, but sometimes they just simply haven't seen, ah, I don't really need that information. Sometimes that happens in an exam because of, of panic, etc. So with problem questions and essay questions, provide clear, simple, ordered and expert advice based on the relevant legal areas and those relevant legal issues. They don't, people who you're advising don't want a full essay, a full academic discourse on offers and invitations to treat. They're saying, tell me what an offer is, tell me what an invitation to treat is. This is what happened in my situation. Can you apply the law to those particular facts? And again, um, a tendency for students is to provide us with long accounts of facts and decisions of cases rather than concentrating on what was the claim? 
what was the claim made in that particular case and what and how did that decision establish a precedent so again students tend to again cut and paste from certain websites the facts of cases the decisions of cases etc keep those to a bare minimum concentrate on what's this case about how is it decided and how does that shape my answer? You know, either advising somebody in a problem question or answering uh, an essay question. Anything else for me, Alison? Not at the moment, no. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, just a few things about using primary and secondary in sources. Um, always consult your, the, the module leader as to what's expected, etc. cetera. Um, but, as with normal exams, you've got to provide primary and secondary sources. It's no use um, you just constructing an answer out of thin air, even though you've got an innate sort of understanding of the rules, etc., and you articulate them very well. You've got to be providing primary and secondary sources, but be prepared to use them constructively. Don't just use them for the sake of saying, well, I know this case it's going in anyway. Don't cut and paste those sources onto your answer without analyzing them or applying them to the question. Now, you're obviously going to get a certain similarity uh, when you use uh, academic sources, either from um, primary or secondary, because they're almost inevitably picked up on some website, etc. But don't just cut and paste them and then say, there is the answer. Fiddle about with them can reconstruct them etc don't take a massive chunk of an academic article and then change one word and don't expect the the examiner to notice that you've cut and pasted etc if you do cut and paste stuff credit it but more importantly blend it into the answer introduce that block of information by a point that you want to make and at the end of that block of information, even though it comes up in pink because it's come from a site, etc., contextualize it, put, in, put it in the context of the question. Therefore, this proves that offers uh, or the adverts can, in fact, be invitations to trade or can be offers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ensure that your sources enhance your answers. And that might seem a daft thing to say, but very often student essays and answers are bobbing along quite nicely until they introduce a source. And then it goes all haywire because they don't really understand the source. They can't explain the facts and the decision clearly, etc., And they end up making the essay worse. Now, you can't leave them out for that reason, but just make sure that you actually understand the source and where it fits in. And I think in particular, get used to paraphrasing a case. Have a look at your textbooks. They're very good at explaining a case, sometimes in two or three sentences. And that's the sort of style that you can use. So introduce your sources to support the, the, the points that you make. And obviously refer that back to your plan. Anything else, Alison, or should we? Um, we have one question, um, just saying, please could you explain how to add secondary sources to problem questions without it seeming forced? Right, <laughs> okay. Um, I think one opinion is that use them very sparingly, secondary sources very, very sparingly. One, if... Um, if it's from a textbook which is laying down basic or this is the way of laying down basic rules, well, to provide whether it's an offer or an invitation to treat, we look at those particular following tests and the tests are intention, practicality, certainty, etc. You can then just put in brackets um, the name of the author of, of the textbook, etc. In terms of secondary sources of journal articles and academic opinion, I, I'm always wary of students using them because I'm not sure whether clients particularly want to get engaged in a strong, um, robust academic argument about the difference between terms implied in law and terms implied in fact, etc. But if that secondary source helps you uh, explain a particular matter or illustrate a particular matter, then do it. I think the use of primary sources 
uh, in problem type questions and the use uh, I and looking at the words of the question and applying those primary sources to the question are the most important aspects of a good problem answer. Uh, although sometimes you have to explain some basic points which you have got from a from a um, an academic textbook or an academic journal. I can see what the the student is thinking is that if you start quoting bits and pieces from a textbook in that academic jargon, it does look a little bit forced and certainly not what the client wants. Uh, but if you can paraphrase what the author was saying and saying, well, the best way of approaching these issues uh, uh, or approaching this answer is looking at three important issues, certainty, reasonableness and fairness, et cetera, and that's come from a textbook, then you can do it in that way. But my, my key advice in terms of answering problem questions is keep um, really strong academic opinion out of it as much as possible. Um, it's really a question of, do you understand the law and the principles and can you apply them to the facts of the case? Okay. Thank you. That's um, all the questions for now. Right. Okay. Just a little bit about um, citing and referencing sources. Consult your lecturer on this, but usually there's no need to create footnotes or employ oscular, etc. You, you're not going to be uh, required to employ the same degree of citation and referencing skills that you would in a coursework. But please consult your lecturer for that, because they may well be saying during that 16 hours, we're asking you to construct a coursework as if it's under coursework instructions. But normally we, we wouldn't do that. You'll need to cite and reference primary sources. So we've given some examples there, section one of the Theft Act, article 10 of the convention, but you can use a less formal one for cases. Um, so rather than putting the full uh, citation and reference for the Miller case, the prorogation of parliament case, you could put Miller 2018. And again, employ a basic referencing system to credit secondary sources. You can put Foster Human Rights, page six, if you've got it in front of you, doesn't matter if you haven't, etc. cetera. Um, but, so there's the advantage of that, but the disadvantage, because you will be expected to employ those sources correctly and clearly. We might be forgiving in a, uh, faced in a live examination where you forget a couple of words of a statute, but there's no really no excuse for getting those words wrong if in, if in fact they're in front of you. Again, uh, I'm an old broken record here, but don't cut and paste them. Uh, that, that's just not good practice. Um, and in terms of lecture slides and notes, um, they're a great source of understanding the subject. They're a great source of organizing the material in preparation of a question because the people who are um, constructing those lecture notes and slides are the people who are doing your exam uh, uh, questions as well. But don't cite them as if they were proper authority. Um, um, use them to support uh, or to support your arguments. You can use them for revision, but when you've done that revision, make sure you're citing primary and secondary sources or uh, established um, uh, established secondary sources. Obviously, if the lecturer has written the book as well, then that's always a good uh, a good ploy to uh, to um, cite their their textbooks. Just a bit of about proofreading. And again, I suppose we've we've always been told this these basic rules. Um, but you've got more time to proofread and therefore the expectations for well-written, structured and coherent answers are even higher now. But you've got more time, you've got more time to do it. Um, so there is that swings and roundabouts about this online open book examination. It takes a lot of the heat off, but it does increase those expectations. But go over your answers at regular intervals and then at the end. Read your answers back to yourself. And sometimes, although it might sound a bit, uh, might be a little bit embarrassing, do this aloud. Um, and I've always say to, to students, imagine me on your shoulder um, when you read that answer. Is Steve Foster going to come back and say, what about this particular issue? Or that's the wrong word, et cetera. So always have you have me on your shoulder when you're doing a coursework, when you're doing an exam question to say, 
would that pass muster with um, with Foster? Uh, and if if that's true, then you, you, you you're going to produce a, a more convincing answer, etc. Employ spell and grammar check at the end. Um, I'm noticing now that even the spell and grammar check isn't picking up certain things. So the number of times that a, a student has called a trial, a trail, uh, which won't be picked up by grammar check, that needs manual <laughs> proofreading. Um, need to look through it and check for things like that, etc. Don't submit your paper until you're ready. Um, don't leave it too late. Um, I'm sure your examiners will be telling you that, but don't submit the exam paper until you, you're completely ready to, to do that. Uh, there might be a temptation to say, let's get it out of the way. But what you don't want then is to find out, oh, I should have included this because usually you can only submit one, one copy of it. But again, check with your, uh, your school as to whether I'm right on, on that. I'm going to move on to uh, answers in specific areas. But Alison, is there, is there anything else yet in... Uh, um, there is one question saying, do you recommend the R IRAC method for yeah. most of the examination methods? Yeah, um, this is really uh, just identifying the points and then applying, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yeah, they, are, they are pretty good. Uh, I mean, there are different... Um, there are different phrases and different systems, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, I, I would always just say to students, have a look at a question very carefully and say, what's the question generally about? And what's it specifically about? What are the specific issues which I have to discuss? So you're starting to build bullet points. Generally, the question is about formation of contract and what terms go into a contract. So I know I need to know that. But specifically, it's about was this an offer? Was this an acceptance? Was this a revocation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and once you've done that, you've identified those particular issues, you can get a plan. Um, and I think this, this system, which the student is referring to then, is just a method by which they're saying, right, you identify the issues, you apply them, you reason them, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so these, these things that people um, um, suggest and these new strategies, et cetera, are always good common sense. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is, can a student identify what the question is about when they look at it? and identify what points they're going to raise and in what order they're going to deal with them. If a student can do that, I think you need less reliance on, the, on those particular strategies because those strategies are no good unless you can look at a question and say, I know what it's about and I'm confident that I can answer it. Very good answer. Thank you. Um, that's yeah. it from now. Thanks. Right. OK. I'm just going to run through a couple of uh, subjects, contract first, taught, um, then public law and human rights, as to identify really the nature of um, contract law questions, taught questions, public law, etc., uh, and giving you some idea of how to approach them. You've got to remember in contract law, um, contract law is a, is a case law subject. Yes, it deals with statutory provisions, but you've got to know your cases. You've got to understand your cases and your statutory provisions. Students either love the subject for that reason or hate it for that reason. They love it for that reason because they don't have to solve the world's problems and constitutional problems and human rights problems, etc. And they say, why could I? Why should I do that? I'm only 18. Don't ask me to do that. Their basic rules, cases to support, exceptions to the rules, cases in support, and you can apply it quite logic logically, etc. The rules are relatively logical. They don't raise many dilemmas, etc., as they would, let's say, in constitutional law. But they do require a certain amount of legal reasoning. You've got to be aware of the necessity in contract of commercial certainty, fairness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we take a question like, by the use of case law, explain how the courts have distinguished between contractual offers and mere invitation to treat, that is not rocket science. As long as you know what an offer is, 
and an invitation to treat, then all you have to do is know the cases and apply them in a logical and structured way. This, is, this requires therefore a fairly straightforward approach. It's not an easy approach because you've got to read the cases, understand them because you're gonna to have to explain them. But you define the terms, you identify the consequences of the court making the distinction, and you provide a number of cases where the courts have made that distinction. Now, there is a certain amount of legally, legal reasoning because you've got to clearly identify why the courts made that decision. Was it because of what the party said or did, or was it because it made commercial sense, etc.? So they're not easy questions to answer. You do need to know your cases, but you, the main skill really is, can you explain long and complicated cases in short and uncomplicated ways and apply them to that particular question. You then get something thrown in like this. The mechanism employed by the courts to imply terms into a contract is both illogical and inconsistent. Lord Foster in Foster and Foster critically discussed this as statement. And you're thinking, I'm out of my comfort zone now. I like that previous question about offers and invitations to treat. This is very much difficult. Again, it requires a case law approach. You need to be aware of the cases and the various cases in illustration and explain the various circumstances where terms can be implied, etc. But you're not going anywhere with this particular question unless you look at two things. One, Lord Foster's statement in the case of Foster and Foster, so as to contextualize it, and then you're going to need help. And you don't get it from the cases, just from the cases, or even from the textbook, you're going to have to read some academic opinion on this, where they have talked about it as an academic issue. This isn't something that you would have discussed in detail in a lecture or in a seminar, etc. It's based on research of the basic rules of implying terms into a contract, but we're going to require something more. We're going to have to employ academic opinion, people who spent a lot of time discussing this issue in a very academic way. So very different from the, the last question and very different from advising people on contract problems. This is one where you can't really provide a satisfactory answer until you read a few very well-established um, journal articles on this particular issue. Looking up on Wikipedia, looking up on Law Teacher Net is not going to give you the answer to that particular question. Then we got the problem questions. I'm not going to read the whole of this problem question, but principally it's, it's, um, it's an idea by a particular um, company who say, right, the World Cup's coming up. Uh, good luck to England. I tell you what we'll do is that you can purchase um, a television to watch the World Cup and you'll get £500 back uh, payable on the World Cup, payable, etc. If England, you know, every time England score a goal, etc. And there's a factual scenario raising all sorts of issues. And unsurprisingly, we go on and win the World Cup. So this is complete fantasy. Uh, and now they're faced with all these particular claims. And it's very helpful for you there. It says at the bottom, Sunny TV refuses to pay anything back, claiming the following. The original advert was not legally binding. And if it was, it was subject to a number of terms, etc. So it's all very interesting to read. Um, but now down to the serious business. What's this about? And how on earth are you going to answer the particular question? So... Firstly, you have to identify what that scenario is all about. And principally, it's about two things. It's about formation of contract. Is, there, is that advert and is that publicity stunt contractually binding? Was it an offer or a mere invitation to treat? Is it a unilateral contract or a mere advertising puff, etc.? And if it is a contract, what were the terms? Do those goals count? And we have to look at the wording of the advert and the basic rules on implying terms into a, into a contract and how words, are how words of a contract are interpreted. For that type of problem question, it's a lot of common sense. 
It's a lot of looking at the words of the advert to see what they actually mean. Yes, you've got a background knowledge of offer, acceptance, etc. But most of all, it's a question of how do I interpret the words of a scenario and the words of a contract? So there we've got a contract problem. Yes, you need to know your cases. You need to know your basic principles. But most of it is, a pl is being able to search for the issue, resolve that issue by being good at interpreting contracts and good at interpreting cases and applying them, et cetera, and then preparing to provide a clear and simple advice. So how do we go about planning that? Brief introduction. Always give a brief introduction at the start of a problem question. Don't write the whole essay. Don't write the whole answer. But a brief introduction saying this raises issues of X, Y and Z. And the issues are, therefore, was this a contractually binding offer? If so, what were the terms of that particular offer? And can we imply terms or interpret the contract differently according to the claims of the parties, etc.? Just to show that you've identified what the issues are and that you know what the dilemmas are in front of you, etc. And then you can go on to consider the points. Was that advert legally binding or was it a mere advertising puff or an invitation to treat or a unilateral contract providing case law for each possibility? But the real skill there, read the words carefully and refer to them when coming to any conclusion. Don't reach a conclusion by saying, well, in my mind, I think that must have that advert is clear enough without saying why you think it's clear enough. Well, it's clear enough because it uses these particular words. We can see in law, therefore, that you need a good logical mind as well as knowledge of the, of the relevant principles. And that's particularly uh, useful when you're applying problem type questions. We'll keep these slides up. I think, Alison, you're gonna put the slides up on uh, uh, online so that people can read them uh, at their own leisure. but. I think that's what I really talk, need to talk about in, in terms of contract law. Is there any uh, question, further questions at this stage? Um, we have a question that's not related to contract. It's probably not in your sort of area of specialism, but they are asking about advice for exams like juris, jurisprudence. Um, mm. Is their approach quite differently from other law modules? Yeah. Well, jurisprudence in you know, itself, legal theory, whatever they call it, etc., is not necessarily diametrically opposed to black letter law. And most most of the subjects that we study on the on the law program are um, black letter law, cases, statutes, etc. It's less concerned with what the statute says and what the cases say and whether there's a line of authority than say philosophical questions of how did that law get there in the first place? What are we looking for in a good law? Um, so it's, it is a, 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 an area which, which I've taught. I suppose the nearest in terms of that I've taught is in relation to human rights, because I say to students, I don't merely want you, want you to tell me what that case about demonstrations how it was decided and what cases the courts took into account, but what underlying principles did the court take into account? Democracy, um, deference to national security, public safety, government accountability, etc. Balancing proportionality, etc. So I think uh, in terms of jurisprudence courses, the advice that we've been giving so far and I continue to give are based on the idea that there are cases there, there are statutes there, this is doctrinal, make sure that you always follow the doctrines and the principles, etc. Jurisprudence is allowing you to think, getting you to think outside that particular box. And if I was a student and I, I liked um, doctrinal law and black letter law and faced with um, a jurisprudence question, I would say help, but there is always help there. I think if you've studied on a jurisprudence course, week in, week out, you will have been given recommended reading uh, of people who talk in that particular fashion, who 
approach issue, uh, legal issues and moral issues in that particular fashion. And you start to learn to walk the walk and talk the talk when you're uh, when you're dealing with uh, jurisprudence as with any as with with any other subject. But it does take a slightly different approach. Um, I suppose the real difficulty is, yes, I've read all those people and I never understand a word they're talking about. Uh, then you're in a, a little bit of difficulty and sometimes you have to go back and simplify things. Uh, and very often you have to do that, but particularly with jurisprudential writers, what on earth are they going on about? And if you can get to the bottom of it and say, principally they're saying this, but in a rather fancy way, they're talking about fairness or logic in, in, in a rather fancy way, then you can start using the fancy words knowing that at least you know the basics, etc. But it is a very different approach. Okay, uh, okay. all right. Uh, uh, very briefly on tort, I would say tort is very similar to contract. The difference is that modern tort law um, particularly in the last 30, 40 years, is very much now based on public policy and human rights. Uh, and almost every area of tort law that you're studying, whether it be privacy, defamation, which we talked about before, negligence, um, duty of care, occupiers liability, vicarious liability, there's always some policy behind it. Should the law be interfering? Should we give exemption to the police for liability, et cetera? So it is a case law subject, supplemented obviously by statutes. It is a doctrinal subject and you have to get your cases and principles right. But there's that underlying question, I think, which the staff are asking you to consider. Is this law right? Should the law be like this? So if, for example, you're given a question about to what extent are the police liable in the tort of negligence, you don't just want to give them the rules of negligence and the cases, et cetera. You want to start thinking about, should the police be liable for the investigation of crime? Uh, what if they're not liable? What human rights might that interfere with, et cetera? So I think there, are, there is a little bit more navel gazing going on in, in, pub, in, um, in tort law than there is in, um, in contract law. You have to think about what's the policy of this law? And we're going back again sometimes to jurisprudential questions. Why does this law exist and why does it exist in this particular way? Because with tort claims, you're either going to satisfy the, the claimant and give them compensation or disappoint them bitterly. And sometimes the rules on contract don't seem to make any sense. Oh, you can't sue in that case for psychiatric injury or nervous shock, etc. And you have to ask, well, why is that the case? So I think the, the textbooks take a slightly different approach and your, your um, lecturers will ask you to look at sources and journal articles which don't just state what the law is, but what the law should be and in what direction it's going, etc. And finally, if we go on to public law and human rights, uh, which is my bag, which is my area, I think we just need a dual approach in the, these cases. A lot of people think I can pass a constitutional or human rights question by having a chat. As long as I'm interested in the news and as long as I sound as if I'm interested in this chat and join this chat, I can do it without any knowledge of the law or any sources uh, or any authority at all. And that's wrong. Constitutional law is law. You may have dealt with politics, government and politics at A level, but constitutional law is law. It's got cases. It's got statutes. Uh, it's got international treaties, etc. And you need to know the legal framework. And so, too, with human rights. You don't just have a chat about whether celebrities should be able to sue in privacy or whether we should have the right to know. There is a legal framework. There are Article 10 of the European Convention, Article 8 of the European Convention, the Human Rights Act, a list of cases, a list of academic opinions, etc. On the other hand, if you just give an answer which is purely black letter law, you're only halfway there. So when you're answering a question, let's say, on the importance of uh, the Human Rights Act, not only do you need to know the why the act is passed, what the provisions of the act say, and 
how the case law is developed, et cetera, you need to be aware of subsidiary issues and issues which surround that. Parliamentary sovereignty, the rule of law, the protection of human rights, the deference that the courts show to parliament or the home secretary, et cetera. And that's particularly evident in the coronavirus situation. So public law questions and human rights questions have got to be a blend of the both. An appreciation of the political and moral and legal issues, yes, but not just that, the law as well. So include the law, include the facts, include the cases and the statutes, etc. but always have in mind these underlying principles of, is that constitutionally correct? Is that good for human rights? Does that offend the separation of powers, etc.? cetera? Um, and most good textbooks will make you aware of, uh, of the need to do that. Okay, so I think that's it in terms of Going through the slides again, Alison's going to put them up online. People can look at the um, at them in their own leisure. Uh, it's now time for questions or any further questions. We had um, one more question on the chat saying, um, do you have any advice on the module of remedies in contract and tort, please? Right. <laughs> OK, what I would say is that... <clears throat> A lot of sometimes a lot of staff try and escape this one because it's a tricky one. They leave it till the end and always leave and always never have enough time to cover it, etc. Students tend to uh, avoid it if they can as well. Um, with remedies, there are obviously rules about remedies, whether it's injunction, specific performance, rescission, uh, quantum merit, damages, or whatever, etc. And they require a logical approach, etc. What I would say about remedies is that your answers are much more convincing if you know a little bit about contract in the first place, that you don't deal with them entirely in isolation. So, for example, to talk about um, remedies of damages, etc., in particular cases, you can see uh, the correlation between terms and the formation of the contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but damages can be quite technical. Um, so sometimes they, they're not as readily understood by students as, as other areas. They do take a little bit of reading, et cetera. What can be very good is looking at practitioners' textbooks on um, remedies because they will tell you how they're applied in practice. You've got to remember that for a student and a staff, we're not really interested in remedies. We're interested in the decision in the case. For practitioners, that's all they're interested in, winning the case and getting a remedy, et cetera. So very often um, practitioners' remedies books or practitioners' textbooks are good for that. Um, but again, a little bit of advice I would give is don't study remedies in pure isolation. Make sure you know how contracts work and what their requirements are. Remedies then make a lot more sense when you deal with them. But it, they do take a, a second and third look, I think, uh, remedies, because they can be quite tricky and they can be quite technical at times. Thank you. I think that, that is all the questions. Um, right. We've answered them all. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah. No more coming through. So um, just to let everyone know again that I am, I can, I will send out the slides direct to all ticket holders, along with a link to the video after the event. So don't worry if you um, do want to see the content again, you'll be able to, and you'll be able to go over the slides in detail. Right. And um, is there anything else that you want to say, Steve? No, uh, apart, apart from good luck, um, Again, I'd stress a couple of things is check out with your module leader that uh, what the arrangements for are for the exams and what the expectations are in terms of grammar, style, uh, referencing, whether they want a bibliography, etc. I've you know, generally assumed that they won't, wouldn't want all that because we don't necessarily want all that at Coventry, but check that out because they're going to be in various forms, etc., um, prepare well in advance, 
uh, use the fact that they're open book as an advantage. You know, there's a comfort blanket, not as a, a, an alternative for, to you answering the question, uh, because it is, again, so tempta- tempting to just cut and paste stuff and put it there and say, well, there's the answer. It's there somewhere. You sort it out. Yeah. Well, we've got one from Vito. Can you see that one? What would you suggest are the best revision techniques to use at this stage? Right, okay. Uh, It really does depend on how well you you are prepared um, and how well you've engaged with the the module so far. And that's not laying any blame. It may well be that you haven't been able to engage fully. If you're fully engaged, you've been fully engaged and you've been going to seminars and you've been practicing these answers, et cetera. I think it's then a question of saying, right, let's get ready for those particular questions and start concentrating my revision on how I would construct an answer, how I would put an answer together, what sources I would put and, and practicing that, et cetera. If on the other hand, you haven't been able to, to engage, et cetera, the best thing is don't go straight into revision when in fact what you need first of all is vision uh what you need first of all is to get the basic rules in your in your head uh do the basic reading go through the textbook the slides the videos etc etc ensure that you are fairly confident with it and then you can start thinking right i'm going to prepare for um prepare for constructing answers for the day etc um but i would think if you're if you're ready for the exam now uh, or in terms of content you know all your stuff start concentrating on um constructing answers and practicing the construction of answers if you're not quite ready carry on uh, or do your do your vision Go and, go and look up those sources, understand those sources, digest them, etc. But obviously, in either case, there's always um, keep an eye out for recent developments. Um, always look at your sources and say, do I understand them? Where would I use them in an answer, etc.? Just keep going over those. We have a question on the chat again saying, um, do you have any tips to elevate a tort law problem question from a 2-1 to a first, given that they shouldn't be really be using academic articles? Right. I think um, it all starts from the introduction, that, that, that very brief introduction before you start tackling the issues. If you're able to say the real issues in this case in this scenario are this, this, and this, and this. And you cover them all. You're likely to cover more, you know, one or two more than other students have covered. The good student will do that. And it exudes confidence. And the, the examiner likes that. The other real skill is that not only do you identify the issue and where the case goes, of how you explain that case and its application to that particular scenario. And you're always looking at the words of the scenario and matching them with the case. And you're always approaching it with an inquiring mind. It could be this, or it could be that. Having said that, this seems to be the most logical. you said that in that case, that shows real thought, it called real understanding, real analysis and real reflection, that you are capable of looking at a scenario, applying the law and thinking of several possibilities and coming up with the most feasible possibility. And a lot of students don't do that. When we say that no academics, the secondary sources should be used, not no academic sources, but academic opinion might not provide the answer because you've got to remember that that academic has never seen this scenario so filling out your answer with what professor x says and what professor y says is only of limited use certainly you can use professor x to say the issues in vicarious liability in the close connection test are very complex they are very um 
complicated, etc., and they may be resolved in this particular way. Um, but the tendency then, the temptation is to, is to carry on that academic discussion rather than answering the problem question. So I think it's the first class student identifies the issues straight away and identifies issues which other students didn't notice. And they've got that stamina. They go throughout, throughout the, the scenario, each line meticulously nitpicking for anything that they can see, which might dictate their answer, etc. But very good structure, very good explanation, and very good application of complicated legal sources within that word limit. Um, coupled with a, a, you know, a smattering of academic opinion to show that you've, you know, you've really understood the, the, the dilemmas, etc. I hope that answers it to a certain extent. Thank you for attending and uh, good luck in your examinations. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.